only one we're only one we're missing, Sue, is uh, uh, Chris Kadamian. So I think we're going to start with. This the, always looks like he's coming coming from a class or going to a class like, and yeah, wearing maybe, a geek. Maybe, so maybe so, I'll, I'll still hold. I'm going to hold off one more time for him. Uh, and we'll start with number two, with uh, which all of us can handle. And uh, in any case, <clears throat> second topic. How do I go about moving up in rank as a black belt? I have left my sensei, or he is deceased, as is his organization, if he had one. Okay. Uh, and there are three and, you know that is a problem I get people ask me that call all the time um, and the, the three options are one I always ask do you belong to an organization that has a promotional procedure uh, is it by self nomination or periodic review how about if I set up a promotional board of my peers for the purpose of evaluating me and third one about how about cross certification, uh, homologous rank, homologous ranks, or other options? So there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> we just spent years on this. Anyway, <laughs> could write a book. Uh, anyway, so uh, morning. Good morning, all. Morning, morning, Darren. And where's oh, there's Robert Jones. So we've got about one, two, three, four, seven yeah. people right now. That's a good group. Anyway, so though we're, we're starting on topic number two since uh, Chris isn't with us yet. And this topic will probably take days to cover, but we'll do what we can. Um, I guess what we first ought to do is how do I go about moving up in rank as a black belt if I have left my sensei or he is deceased as is his organization if he had one? Anyone want to handle and answer that generally or before we move to the subtopics? Wow, that's a toughie. Um, I, I face that dilemma myself um, with jujitsu and I had that dilemma for a very long time in Kempo. Um, in Kempo, it sort of took care of itself because there are so many who were doing a similar system of Kempo. And I ended up with Al Tracy, who actually passed away a couple of years back, but uh, promoted me before he left to Tenth Don. So, um, so that sort of took care of itself in terms of Kempo. But in Jiu Jitsu, I've been doing joint locking with a Korean style probably since I was 11 years old somewhere thereabouts. And um, I've studied Aikido Jiu-Jitsu, which I actually prefer because that, that, that was the style that was closest to my early origins, which are more, is more like a glorified form of pop keto. And um, what I found is I think, <clears throat> I don't know, Jiu-Jitsu is hard because there are so many different styles of Jiu-Jitsu. And yet I was just, thinking about this the other day, I was going through, I, I ran across a, a video, which is ancient because uh, uh, Master Kirby had hair, I think in those days. And it was <laughs> not unlike the ancient <laughs> videos of myself. Uh, but I, um, I looked at uh, the video and it was a Budo Shin, you know, basically through green belt, I think it was, if I remember correctly. And I, I just watched all the techniques as they were demonstrated. And I thought, well, in either my jujitsu system or in my Kempo system, I've done all of those, but some didn't, you know, some didn't make their way into the jujitsu system, but it's sort of understandable if you understand Kempo's roots and Okazaki and Danzenru and the people that sort of played into that a little bit. But um, I think it's, I, I don't know. I sort of look at it like this. If you've got a bachelor's degree, and you go to another university, they're not going to make you redo the bachelor's degree again. Uh, they're going to say, okay, let's, let's have you do a master's now. Um, even if that master's degree is in something entirely different, like I've seen people come into the political science arena 
and they had a master's in business administration or something, and they're now in the PhD program in political science. Um, aside from the unwisdom of doing that, uh, they actually came in yeah. and, 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 and actually uh, participated uh, reasonably. Now they had in the political science department that I was in, they said, well, now you have something called common body of knowledge stuff, CBK. So you're going to have to do like 10 credits of coursework or something, or 12 credits of coursework that is CBK stuff that we would consider, you know, necessary for you to know. And so they put them in undergraduate classes to do those. And then they moved into the graduate program. Uh, and I think maybe we should do that. I think if somebody has a black belt, you know, okay, well, then you're a black belt for the moment, but uh, let's, let's, here's some CBK stuff that we need to study. Um, here's, here's the curriculum as it's laid out and blah, blah, blah. And I, I think that's be a wise move, particularly because you have so many people. Like I've seen some jujitsu styles that bear absolutely no resemblance to the ones that I've, come up through or even related to the ones that I've come up through, but there are some that are pretty similar. And so, you know, I guess if you find, well, gee, I want to do this style. Okay. Well then here's the similarities. Here's the differences. The CBK is going to involve you doing the differences. Once you're caught up with that, then we can move on to need on or sound on or whatever it is that you that you are, I think. Any, anyone else have any other other thoughts on this general question? I, 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 my, my comment is as a as a, a young old person, <laughs> <laughs> as a young old person, and someone who who has currently two um, uh, a net, uh, I guess national organization affiliations. Um, uh, and I think I, I think I want to survive being in these organizations, so I want to be gentle with what I say. Um, but I think that you know, that whole common body is 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 a, a you know as as a Bob said, is, you know, if we all could agree on quote unquote common body uh, of knowledge, and and a person doesn't give up their their belt per se, but understanding that when you when you go to another um, instructor. Um, you have to be humble <laughs> uh, and not throw what, what you what you had or what you have around and so and step in that but then that common body kind of um, a not knowledge and then it's up to the it's up to the instructor and up to the system you know uh, it's a tough one <laughs> I, I agree look I think my comments only um, add to because I'm very intrigued about the topic itself. Um, when you talk about the common body knowledge or or versus the across certification, then you know or or just respecting somebody's previous current rank when they when they step into the dojo for whatever reason it might be. Um, I think the the two between the the common body knowledge and then the cross certification stuff really conflicts with each other. I mean, because you have this expectation from the cross certification to be able to perform, execute, understand, know, have the experience in, in specific areas uh, that relate to the entire program. But then you consider the common body knowledge of somebody walking in saying, okay, you're, you're relative to it, but you don't have everything and we'll honor the rank. And I think that takes away from the cross certification. Um, but again, I think just my comment there kind of adds to the to the topic a little bit more. I'm interested to hear what everyone else has to continue to offer uh, as it relates to the topic. Okay, anyone else before we? I, 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 I would just add that so much of this, really all of it is so contextual. And in my experience with it, which is mainly Budishin, which has a clear cut set of um, expectations for Shodan and then uh, technical expectations up through, I guess, fifth on. Um, everything is very clearly delineated. Then it becomes more honorary and uh, recognizing of, of work you've done for the organization or for martial arts after that. Not every martial arts organization is like that. And in every situation, you have to sort of say, well, what does being a third don really mean, given your background? What, what did that, what did you do to achieve that? 
and in the United States, and I and, and in, I guess in Japan too, there's no there's no universal uh, regulatory body that says this this uh, don rank means you can do this, like you can be an instructor at Shodan versus Sandan. That's totally up in the air. So it it it, it uh, invites the question of well, what does it mean in your organization? Um, in, in the United States, it seems that black belt, uh, for better or worse, has gotten. Uh, circulation as a not necessarily an expert but somebody who really knows what he's doing in an art and that, I think that's fine in Japan it seems to really be much more the beginning of advanced learning where it's not as big a deal um, I think in Buddhist and George black belt is is a truly significant step and you can teach you can open your own dojo and that's a that's one way of recognizing the significance of first dawn but it gets very contextual after that, and it depends on the organization. It depends on the country. Okay. Any other thoughts offhand? Okay. Um, I think if we look at the original question, how you block, move up in, with black belt, and, and the issue is in particular, if, if your sensei or organization has disappeared for whatever reason um that's that's an issue that that's the issue of this question um and if you belong to an organization that has a pr promotional procedure um some allow it by self-nomination and some do it by periodic review I, I, I don't know exactly where the AJA is on this, although I think it's some sort of combination of both. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's more like, I believe if you would, you know, your sensei is gone and you have no place to go, that you can appeal to the, uh, go to the, well, the NSTB, National Standards and Certification Board, and say, right. uh, I would like to be considered, and there there are quite general criteria in the Constitution and bylaws of the AJA. There are a few other organizations that do things similarly, so it gives a person <clears throat> uh, an option for promotion. Now, whether this is a promotion, whether that's this is also seen as a promotion by my peers one's peers is another matter. Um, and that depends how the AJ or the NS, National Standard, NSCB, how it, it, how it would set up an evaluation panel. Um, and uh, I think that's a responsibility of the AJ president or vice president to do. I'm not sure. I haven't read the constitution in recent years. And, uh, um, I can tell you that it is. It's the responsibility of the AJA vice president, Jeff Wynn, at this point. He's head of the NCSB, National right. Certification and Standards Board. Right. And in a situation where somebody is out without anybody of high rank to promote him, they can offer that kind of evaluation that you described. And in your situation, because nobody's ranked or you have the highest rank in, in Budishin, although I know there are other 10th dons, but who promotes you because you're the top rank that, that that's those standards are established or recognized by that kind of board, I think. And that advances very high ranking people to my understanding. Right. And, and I, I would hope that if someone goes to the NSCB and, and is seeking rank promotion for, for them, that uh, it would be nice if none of the, NSCB members for this promotion would be students of the person that is being considered for promotion. Mm -hmm. um, that would, you know, plus the AJA has different rue in it, so it might, you know, behoove to have the panel made up of, of different rue. What what you what the panel has to do essentially is is be credible. Um, and the other other issue of peers, which I have seen sometimes. And it's not uncommon. Um, let's say if I wanted to be promoted to 11th Don, 
uh, which isn't going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> I would get a bunch of my black belts who I felt liked me um, and are interested in promotion themselves if I really want to abuse this, you know. And I would say, okay, you guys get together, promote me to a higher rank, and then I can promote some of you to 10th down maybe someday. And the problem with using, you know, it's how you define your peers. Um, if they're all your students, it's, you know, there's, there are some real, how do you say, you may really be looking at a Swiss cheese. Uh, if, if it's not your peers, then it's probably more legitimate because they don't have a vested interest in promoting you. Um, so, you know, as far as peers are concerned, I, anybody else have a thought on, on being promoted by one's peers? That's P-E-E-R-S, not P-E-I-R-S, or is it P-I-E-R-S? Which... <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, I guess my thought on that is that there are places out there like Atama, for example, uh, that gather together groups of high ranking people in order to address this very issue of saying, you know, well, if somebody's an orphan, per se, then let's kind of take care of that person. Um, and, and I think those are viable, but that's not, a, in a sense, it's your peer group in the real truest sense of the term, it's your peer group, but, uh, but it's not somebody, for example, that you have a relationship to, um, have certainly no, a student instructor relationship where you're the, you have the power dominance in that relationship, I think, you know, and, and academics is funny because, uh, who makes a PhD? Um, well, the answer to that is a board of other PhDs. Um, and so you have to, you have to create a, um, a, a, a prospectus for your dissertation. You have to say, here's, here's what I plan on doing. They're going to look at it and say, okay, we'll schedule a defense of your dissertation prospectus. So then you have to go in front of them and defend it. And then you have to do the research. And then once you come back with the full dissertation published, then you have to defend your dissertation. And after all of those steps are followed, then that person's conferred the degree. You know, they get put it actually on stage. But, uh, and I think that's probably not a bad model to look at. If somebody wants to create their own system, who doesn't these days, I guess, I don't know. It's a little out of touch there for me on that score, but, but I think, um, then you get a group of your peers together, a board, if you will, and you say, "Here's, here's what I propose to do." Okay, uh, a couple of them decide, "Sure, this is, this is fine," and you know, consider this and consider this and consider this. This is what we're going to ask you to do. You know, you have to put together a complete syllabus through whatever rank you're proposing that we place you to, uh, and then maybe from there, the guy runs off, does his research comes back and says, here's what I've done, presents his style to, to the, the people involved. And then they say, okay, well, that's either good or not so great. And here's how you can improve it. Or here's how, you know, it, it seems to have been exactly what you said you were going to deliver when we talked about your prospectus, you know, I guess is, is, uh, yeah. in PhD, to continue the PhD example, there's also the idea of having outside examiners come in sometimes. Only too. one. Only one. Yeah. There's, only, there's well, only one guy. And he comes from outside the department in another discipline. Right. But, and but that, that, yeah, at, at, at a certain easy. level, at a, with, with, because PhD research is often so abstruse and specific, uh, it, the chances of nobody of having, of finding somebody who doesn't know about the, the person being examined are slim. That it's, there's that, you have to have a certain level of knowledge and commonality in order to judge the other person. So your chances are you're familiar with them. And it, it seems the same in martial arts where at very high levels, and I'm thinking of like Iaido or Japanese swordsmanship, the highest ranking people tend to know each other. So 
there's yeah. there are political issues that may come into play at at those levels too but that's yeah I, I, that's that's where one of the things I often say about martial arts is the difference between martial arts and Boy Scouts is the Boy Scouts have adult supervision. But <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the biggest, uh, uh, I think at some point though, and you may even have people on your committee that they usually dealt in some manner with your, with the field that you're, with the area that you're doing your research in. But at the bottom line, some of them may not even like what you're doing and say, you know, I think you need to reshape this project in this direction. If we if we sincerely did this process a lot more like that, I think it'd be better for everybody involved, both for the credibility of the, the ranking, as well as for the credibility of the people participating in the process, and certainly for the credibility for the guy that's seeking to get it done. Well, uh, I, think, I think that's why the AJA in its has some general criteria of what the promotional panel will be looking at. And that's kind of sets up a framework. And I sort of, I think I did the same thing with respect to Buddhist and jujitsu, because I think if, if you're going to go after something like in a PhD, you need to know what your parameters are and what is going generally what is going to be expected of you and then you need to you need to function within the within those boundaries um and that's that sets us we call it a standard or whatever you want to call it um i know when i went for my master's degree they wouldn't allow us to do a thesis uh, because they figured anybody that's in the master's program at cal state la in social sciences could do a thesis. That's a no-brainer. I mean, I wrote, I wrote part of one um, independent study. I know I wrote part of the quote-unquote instructors. I know I wrote part of his doctoral thesis, about sixty <laughs> to seventy pages. I mean, it was a topic up my alley, so it was a no-brainer. But. <laughs> Um, so they gave us four, four hour exams. Then you had to go in and they would pick out parts of your oral exam and ask you to explain that. Uh, that was the most challenging part, explaining what you'd written down a month earlier and forgot about, but, uh, <laughs> or two earlier, but, uh, you, you do have to, I think we're, the organizations that are successful at this, whether it be martial arts or PhD programs, is if you have general criteria, then people can either, they can or they cannot function within those criteria. Um, Darren, who is cross-certified, not to pick on Darren, um, he came to us and he had, you know, he looked at the criteria, he was able to work within the general criteria and so he got was cross certified. Okay, almost died, Sensei. Oh, that was pretty difficult. Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> I detected a bit of sarcasm there, but anyway, that's okay. No, that was, was also true? a very that was, was also a true? very impressive. <laughs> also a very impressive video there. Yeah, it was, but in any case, you know, I think I think I think that's I think that's the issue. The issue comes down to credibility of a promotion, <clears throat> and. If you, uh, that's, that's why I tell people, if you go into a dojo, see wallpaper, and wallpaper to me yeah. might be 20 or 30 certificates up on the wall, turn around and mm. walk out. Yeah. Uh, um, because you don't need, you know, a person who's credible doesn't need all that. Two or three is more than enough overkill. Um, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I also tell people when they go into a dojo, you know, if they're concerned about a promotion, ask for the name and the address of the promotional organization. And if the instructor won't give it to you or it's not on the certificate, turn around and walk out. Um, mm, okay. Because anybody can make up a certificate. That's what's so nice about technology. Um, you can make beautiful certificates in any language and <laughs> uh, you know, what else can I say about it? Um, uh, there's also the fact of uh, 
uh, depends on what the what those uh, certificates are in as well. Uh, like there are there's, there are no ranks in in boxing or Muay Thai, but uh, if you if you hear someone that uh, that calls himself a, a a black belt in Muay Thai, that's another uh, area uh, yes. that you can just walk away from. Because mm-hmm. I mean that uh, that's a, a very posh right there, uh, and and also a black belt in in boxing. Like, there's never been a uh, a belt ranking in boxing. So there's a local uh, guy here that does kickboxing. He's a, he's a master instructor in kickboxing, um, and uh, I, I always laugh at that because I, as far as kickboxing goes, I'm a friend of Bill Wallace's, and that's what I think of kickboxing when I say that. So how can you have a rank in that? But um, right. generally, he's just a guy beating up a bag who basically is giving out belt levels for that. Yeah, um, uh, and then you have the yeah. di- you have the different types of, of kickboxing. Uh, what uh, which, what kind of kickboxing is it? Cardio kickboxing, or is it uh, K one style kickboxing? Uh, it's like and it, it, it does need need to be specific. Uh, it it it. From what I understand of kickboxing, kickboxing is, is basically a tournament, like like K1. Uh, that uh, that implies you have a rank in, um, say, a, a, a karate style, and you're you're just transferring uh, your fighting style into a tournament setting. So uh, I don't think that there's a, a rank in kickboxing as well. Okay. Um- I, I think what it comes down to is, again, it comes back down to credibility of the credibility of the promotion. Uh, you know, you, you can you can get a bunch of kickboxers or even jujitsu jitsu people together and they can set up their own organization and promote whatever they want or whomever they want or whatever they want. Um, but ultimately, you know, because there is no, as, as uh, uh, Tom said this, there's no national governing body for jujitsu. Uh, official, you know, governmental governing body. Uh, it's, it's really, it really comes down to the ultimate credibility of the organization and the program. And uh, um, some people will accept whatever is written on paper and some people will check into what's written on paper. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like it, it comes back down to consumer beware. Um, mm. you, you as a consumer, at least in the U.S., you as a consumer ultimately need to make yourself knowledgeable about whatever you're buying or whatever product you're after. Because, uh, unfortunately, there are people out there that are unscrupulous and declare themselves master instructors or all high poobahs. Um, and unless you check them out, you know, there's, <clears throat> they stay there. Um, yeah. I, um, and the, the, the tendency of people to give themselves grandiose titles. And again, this is because there's no regulation. You can call yourself anything you want to call yourself a master, grandmaster, uh, apply names to yourself that, uh, are designed to, yeah, designed to impress other people, but they're really meaningless unless you know the context in which they're being applied. Like I, I think Kano's system, the, the belt system is brilliant if you are working within it and you're managing a dojo where you want to have certain levels doing certain things and interacting and hierarchically. But once you get away from that, that a knowledge of what the ranks and titles mean, then if anything goes and it, it's like saying a general in a really uh, a developing country is this is not the same thing as a general in the united states or some developed country's army like they're entirely different it, there's entirely different meaning to them if you compare them directly maybe in context they're more meaningful yeah okay let's let's uh let's move on here uh and deal with how about cross certification, which would be being rank in one martial art and crossing into the rank of another martial art. 
Uh, then there's homologous ranks, which means you have a rank in judo, karate, and aikido. Therefore, we're going to give you a rank in jujitsu, uh, or you have a rank in uh, God knows whatever else. And uh, I would even say, not to pick on jujitsu per se, but let's say you have a rank in Kitsugo jujitsu, which I studied, and Therefore, we're going to give you a rank in Budoshin Jiu-Jitsu, uh, which doesn't quite convert. There are lots of bits and pieces that need to be picked up. Uh, same as, uh, as in uh, Seki's Jiu-Jitsu is not identical to what I teach because I've also had Katsugo. Uh, and I've blended both Katsugo and Seki's jiu-jitsu into what today is Budoshin. Uh, and mm -hmm. people do that. It's, you know, inevitably you take what you know and blend it together so that you end up with something that works for you. And if you're lucky, you get to teach it. <clears throat> and if it makes sense, the world is good. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> the question is, what what are you, anyone's thoughts on, on cross -cert? certification and to define it that would be you are perhaps either one style of your one style of we'll keep it within jujitsu for simplicity your one style of jujitsu and you want to have a rank in another style of jujitsu okay that would be cross certification that's how we're going to define it um <clears throat> Now, it does not mean that you will get an equal rank in the jiu-jitsu you're trying to cross-certify for. For example, mm -hmm. uh, Budoshin jiu-jitsu, regardless of a person's rank in another style of jiu-jitsu, the highest it will cross-certify is up to fifth done. Because after that, it's honorary. And mm -hmm. Budushin, we kind of believe if it's going to be honorary, it's what you put out to help Budoshin jiu-jitsu. Right. After fifth, fifth, at fifth on and higher, you know, it's, it's what you're giving back. And if you haven't been with the Buddha Shin Jiu Jitsu, you probably haven't been giving anything to Buddha Shin Jiu Jitsu. So it's your commitment. Okay. Uh, and that's why the limitation is fifth on. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is, what are your thoughts on, on cross certification as an option for promotion or recognition or what have you any any thoughts or yeah. well i i guess i um i can i can say i think the um, the, the legitimacy of the promotion is what it all comes down to as you've noted and i think um the bottom line is if you now have a teacher who's decided to take you in and decided to give you that rank. That's okay. What are you, uh, you're going to tell the guy how he should run his show. Um, the other side of that being that <clears throat> credibility is a tenuous thing. Um, I was taught by Ed Parker who gave him his 10th degree. You know, mm. I, 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 I don't know personally. I, I just know that the people he hung out with had no problem with him wearing one. Yeah. Um, I, I, I look at the same, you know, I've also trained after Parker died with Larry Tatum, for example, and Larry will point blank tell you, nobody gave him his 10th and nobody gave him his eighth or his ninth for that matter. Uh, but you know, if you watch him move in the, in the world I travel in, you go, yep, that's a 10th. And everybody just, accepts that for what it is. And then the other side of that is you can have a guy who's incredibly uh, insightful, excellent practitioner, excellent technician. And because somebody doesn't like him somewhere, you know, it's like they'll, they'll watch Jesus walk on water and say, well, you know, he doesn't swim too well. So I don't know, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and there, there are people like that. So I don't know that there is a magic pill of credibility uh, that you can apply in all facets of the martial arts. But um, I think there's, there's got to be a, somewhere a meeting ground where you can, most reasonable people would look at it and go, 
okay, um, you know, that's... Okay, we're, we're, we're not talking about promotions per se, we're talking about cross-certification. So let me... Yeah, and cross-certification, cross is uh, that, that's what I was kind of dealing with at first. I was saying, well, you know, somebody is this style and some other person comes in and say fifth don from another style you decide to make them a fifth don in your style who's to say yeah yeah it, it does it does ultimately come down to you know who, who's to say but let me let me pick on darren again since, <laughs> since he was a victim of the buddhist and jiu-jitsu cross-certification process <laughs> and uh, i mean it let me put put the question this way to Darren. Uh, did you have any preconceived notions about cross certification and evolution jujitsu before you decided to do it, or what? And was the process difficult or just challenging, or do you think it was fair, or reasonable, unreasonable? You can be honest. Uh, yeah, no, I, I will, Sensei. Um, but that's the the cross certification for me was. Um, I always feel like rank is an honor. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's something that you should ask for. I don't, at least in my opinion, I don't think it's something you should ask for. I think that it should be recognized by, you know, who, whoever the leaders are in your organization. Um, and, and to have the opportunity to participate in such a detail oriented, um, thorough, um, precise curriculum in, in Budo Shin um, and then be able to, to be evaluated by the board members of Budo Shin to, to award rank in a cross certification to me was extremely honorable. I mean, I've been, I've been affiliated with, with, with you sensei since 2004. Um, yeah. I've, I've been around for, you know, a little bit of time with that and I've, I've done, traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu and Manameru jiu-jitsu since 1989. Um, and for me, they were, they were extremely parallel and, and the, the curriculums were, were, were very parallel as, as it relates to techniques, terminology, um, expectation, performance development, and, and every, almost every criteria. Uh, there, was some, there was some differences but that doesn't mean that the, the cross certification wasn't challenging. Like, like I said, I mean, I was joking, but literally that was one of the, you know, short of my, um, I, I would say it was as I would always refer to when I was evaluated for Shodan by Sensei Jack Garrett um, was the most physically demand, demanding thing that I've ever done. Um, he, he had this expectation and I had to do these physical things and, um, in order to demonstrate my abilities. And um, that was extremely challenging and demanding. Um, and, and the cross certification for Budo Shin was again, parallel to my experience with that. Um, I felt that the end result was, um, was an honor to wear to what I received. And um, to go through that curriculum and to be awarded rank, to officially be awarded rank by the board yourself um, was a tremendous honor. And I think it was, um, I, I think that's how receiving rank should be, in my opinion. I, I think that it shouldn't be short of that. And again, I understand if you go back to the previous topic of, you know, if you don't have, if there's an absence of, of your original instructor or the system or whatever it might be. And then honoring somebody's rank when, they, when they're in, entering your facility. Um, and, and that's where my com conflict would come because looking at the cross certification or even just your participation in, in your current system, not disrespecting anybody that comes in, but it's a, it's a little different. Like I felt that going through all of that material and I, there's a bunch. I've, I've actually printed out everything. It's probably about 15 pounds worth of paper, printed paper that I had to go through the um, the Budo Shin uh, curriculum and syllabus. And, and then I've also added um, Sensei Dave's 
books in there as well to, to kind of get more more knowledge and experience about it. I mean, it, it's a bunch. I have, I mean, I have it sitting right here. It was a lot. And to just be able to take somebody to come in and look at them and then do a, a quick evaluation, you know, almost feels like they're cheating a little bit. I'm not saying it's not, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, from going through, I think that, um, and it maybe there's different levels and, it, and I understand that. Um, but again, to stay on track or try to stay on track as best I can, uh, the cross certification for Budoshin was a tremendous honor. Um, even though I, I almost died, I didn't. Um, but <laughs> it was, uh, it was certainly worth every bit of what I put into it. And I felt like I put my heart and soul into it and, and very honored to, uh, to officially be, you know, receiving rank in, in Budoshan. Darren mentions the idea of parallel parallelism or use the word parallel. And uh, that seems critical in the cross certification world. The, the um, it seems crazy to take somebody who has 15 or 20 years of experience in one traditional, traditional jujitsu style, and then um, expect them to start at white belt or some low rank in another style they're adopting. But the question of how parallel the styles are seems critical. Can they, can they come to Budoshin and do the majority of techniques in an acceptable way in, in a way that the, the belt level that they're trying to get certified for could do that. That's the least problematic way of cross certifying that parallelism and ability to replicate what's really going on in the style you want to get certified in. But uh, other than that, when you go outside that too far, you begin to question, well, what is, what does this cross cert certification mean? If there's that lack of parallel. I, 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 I found from experience, I, I, I know Dave, Dave can probably back me up on here because he's been to summer camp. Uh, and I, I've known this even from prior experience. What you can get a group of first Browns and Shodans together in Jiu Jitsu, different styles, uh, who seemingly have no connection. And once they get past their terminology issues, English or Japanese, it's amazing how much they knowledge they have in common. And mm. they actually, I, I think from the summer camps, people, one of the takeaways is people are surprised by how much other styles of jujitsu know that are similar to what they knew already. And it's that, it's that I think that's one of the unique aspects of traditional jujitsu. There is an incredible amount of commonality in techniques once you get past the language barriers uh, and maybe you know slight differences in how things are done um, mm -hmm. and and i think dave can bear that out the other thing i want to want to take to compliment dave uh dave has done a lot of additional research and digging and uh, writing on his own pertaining to buddha to buddha shin jiu-jitsu uh, and you really should get his stuff because it's good. Um, and George Krishnan, who's up in Canada, has also done some creative stuff. And, and this is this is one of the things I like to see in my black belts is that you know I know all of you have a tremendous depth of knowledge, and that depth of knowledge probably goes beyond quote unquote Budo Shin Jiu Jitsu. And or you have different ways of teaching the same techniques or, uh, and, and I think if you took the time to sit down and put it down in writing, it would be something that, you know, we can all grow from each other. And uh, to me, that's a really important part of growing in, in any subject area, whether it be uh, physics or political science or jujitsu or hop chop soy, uh, <laughs> or you know, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, you know, everybody has something to give. Um, I know as a public school teacher, I learned so much from my students on how to improve my teaching skills. And mm -hmm. my kids were fairly honest with me. Um, I mean, it's rough when you're teaching an, uh, econ, econ, an honors economics class and one kid three three weeks into the semester says, "Mr. Kirby, can't we do something else on the lecture? This is boring." 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something I'd like to share, if I may. Um, it, it, just let me finish. When I turned it around with the kids and said, come up with an idea. And they did. And it actually worked. And it made, you know, it made it a, when kids had to take economics in their senior year, they wanted to have me as their teacher because they knew what things were going to happen. And it wasn't just going to be a bunch of lecture and answer questions and follow graphs and all that other stuff. Go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say, uh, Darren's humility won't allow him to go there because he won't talk about himself. But um, when he when he did the cross certification, Darren's um, um, process was filmed as a documentary. And if you haven't seen the documentary, it is worth checking out, however you can get it. If you can't get it any other way, contact Darren. He might send you a link to it. But it's remarkable. Darren challenged himself to the nth degree uh, and really established a marvelous standard for cross-certification for that rank. Right. Um, I get chill bumps thinking about what I saw, and I watched it twice because I, I almost didn't believe some of what I was watching the first, the first time I saw it. Yeah, it's, it's well, well done. Yeah, very well done. And I'm so glad you filmed it. And, and, and I've learned from my students and even other black girls, it's it's amazing. It's amazing what you can put. I'm saying this to all of you. It's amazing what you can put together when you decide to do it. And, and that's mm -hmm. a compliment. That's a compliment to Darren. It's a compliment to Dave. Uh, because we all, part of our nature is to be very humble. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that you need to get out of that humbleness. Um, and it, Darren is very humble. But in the process of cross certify, he really did a beautiful job. Um, and there are, you know, there, there, you know, we have cross certification, you know, usual the cross certification with be, with Buddhist is, is, is not as simple as it looks on paper. Most people drop out because we ask them to cross certify the terminology. You know, find their name from their styles and the Buddhist and stuff. That's that's the killer for most people. But the thing is, we cry. We we say if you're going for a rank in Buddhist and Jiu Jitsu, we want to know that you can use the terminology and you can teach Buddhist and Jiu Jitsu. Not that you're just going to you know go through a demonstration and say, yeah, he does Jiu Jitsu fine. He's third down or fourth down or you know whatever. Um, we're looking at other criteria, and. Um, before I lose my train of thought here. Um, ah, which I did. Uh, but I think that's what that's what kills, that's where people, most people give up right there. And of the people who submit all of the quote unquote written material and documentation, there's a very high rate of success. But some people, you know, or in the video, you know, but some people just think it's well, either it's overwhelming or they don't have the skill or, you know, they they realize, you know, this is for whatever reason, they believe it's too difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, they, they, you know, they, they withdraw. And so I, I would probably say. And, and yes, we want the we want the cross certification process to be restrictive to the point that we know the person is capable of teaching Budo Shin Jiu Jitsu and can do it. We've had one or two people who have gotten the rank of Budo Shin Jiu Jitsu and then gone their merry way. And there's not really too much you can do about it, unfortunately, in the real world. Uh, but uh, our criteria is for Budo Shin Jiu Jitsu. And that's what, you know, that's what we expect you to be able to do. I, and I know Darren can do it and he's doing it. Okay. And, but like I said, we have, I think since we started the cross certification, we have maybe five people that have made it. Mm. So Darren's a really pretty select, a really select group. <laughs> but I can see them. most of those people have self 
how do you say it? They have self disqualified themselves because they couldn't meet the criteria or they felt they couldn't meet the criteria. And, and maybe their system just, you know, and, and the, if, if, and all that, all, the other thing is our criteria is online. One thing I learned early on in my teaching career is that your students have to have all the information necessary so that they can progress and do a good job. They need to know what your criteria for promotions or grading is. They need to know all that stuff. And once all that stuff is out there, teaching is an absolute blast because then, then you're no longer, as I say, you're no longer a teacher, you're a guide. <laughs> And that's what teaching should be, is being a guide. Uh, because the, the students have the tools. And once they have the tools, they have, you know, they, they really believe more that they're in control of things. But uh, I don't know, you know. Well, Sanche, I, I could share a little. There's, um, first of all, thank you for your comments and Dave's comments. Uh, truly an honor to hear to hear both. Uh, and um and hearing your compliments about, about my process. Um, but I, I certainly appreciate the, the, what it takes for credibility and the requirements for, for Budoshin. Um, more times than I would like to experience when I'm in other dojos, working with other systems, other people, and looking at what their requirements are, what their experiences at what levels that they're at um there's more than the number of times that i would like to be able to share um that when i go into one of those facilities people are talking about what rank they are whether it's a first degree second degree third degree black belt or even higher whatever it is and in most cases when we you know we put people in there that are budo shin or manami ru or jujitsu oriented and and understanding what that expectation is, the the other systems, their third degree black belts are equivalent to the color ranks that we have in, in our system. And and then you ask, well, and, and because you have certain criteria, certain objectives, certain timelines that you need to be able to be affiliated with to be able to advance. And when you ask somebody in today's dojos and what they commonly refer to now in gyms or whatever you want to say, wherever they're training, they're like, I've been training a long time. And then when you ask the one simple question, well, how long have you been training to say that you've been training a long time at the time to, to achieve the rank that you're at, whether whatever Don rank that you're at. And, and you had these young, young practitioners that are referred to as professors. And I'm like, how long have you been training? And they're like, oh, I've been training forever, you know, like like five years. And I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> start yet. Like, and, and that's what confused, like, I'm like, that's what that's what you see most of these days. And I'm like, you you didn't even start yet. Your path has you're not even close. Without knowing context, those titles are just completely meaningless. And it's those are the kinds of questions you have to ask beyond even just like number of years. I mean, that could mean uh, three hours, uh, five, four days a week, or it could mean once a week for one hour. There are so many variables that you need to, you, you have to have the information fleshed out a little more before you can understand what you're dealing with. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's also watching, uh, watching how they move. Uh, that, would, uh, that can also determine how well they know the material and being able to execute the, the, uh, the, the material. Okay. Mm. Let's, let's, uh, let's hit on the hot topic here. Uh, homologous ranks. Uh, when I think of homologous ranks, I immediately think of homogenized milk. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, probably most of you grew up after you could buy homogenized milk. When I was a kid, there was no such thing as homogenized milk. It was just pasteurized. And you had to shake up the milk to get the butterfat mixed <laughs> back into the milk. 
Yes, yes, Otherwise, yes. Otherwise, you yeah. have a learning experience uh, in both <laughs> ends of the bottle. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and, and homologous, to give it a definite, anybody want to define what homologous means? I mean, I have my own definition, but uh, uh, anybody else have a definition of a homologous promotion? It's okay, we can have multiple definitions. <laughs> okay. You're on mute, uh, Robert. You're, you're on mute. Uh, homologous to me means that a person has secured rank in one or two or maybe three martial arts. And therefore, the promoting organization or sensei is giving him a promotion in a, another martial art because this person, because they have ranks in these other one, two, or three, or four, whatever martial arts, is therefore qualified to receive rank in this mm, other martial okay. art. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not... It's not you got a rank in one style of karate, therefore we're going to give you rank in another style of karate. It doesn't work that way. But it's like you you have a rank in maybe judo and aikido, so we're going to give you a rank in aikijutsu. Aiki <laughs> yeah. uh, or aikijutsu, whatever you want to call it. There are all sorts of cute names. Uh, and some of them are legitimate, some are not. So what are, I guess, what are your thoughts? Unless you, if someone has another definition, I'm open to getting it because it may be better than what I have. This sounds uh, incredibly unscrupulous. You want to re say what you just said, the last word? Sounds incredibly unscrupulous. Oh, unscrupulous. Okay. I thought, I thought the L was replaced with the E sound and I wasn't. <laughs> You, you, you have to know Dave. Dave does plays on words. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody, he, he, he can say things with a totally straight face, and there'll be one word in the middle of a sentence that he's best with, <laughs> intentionally. Uh, <laughs> just trying to hold my own, Sensei. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, okay. It, it seemed, okay, any other thoughts that, you know? Yeah, I, I just, I Googled the term homologous promotions, and the first thing that came up in the martial arts context was an article by none other than you in the AJA newsletter from 2002. And you explain this whole concept a lot more, but you use the analogy of pancakes, making pancakes and how the, if you put all the ingredients into a bowl, those ingredients are still the individual ingredients that they, and if you're taking very different martial arts and just sticking them together, that doesn't make, that doesn't wash in the end. Mm -hmm. It doesn't create something. Yes. Okay, this is going to be a dead topic, or <laughs> do we bury Mr. it now? Cubby, or... <laughs> Mr. Kirby, I had an experience of a, a gentleman approached me, and he had done Aikido and Judo and Karate, and he said basically uh, that he'd done the three arts of Aikido, Judo, and Karate, is it possible for him to have had, uh, got a black belt, at least a shodan, because he said when he looked at the jujitsu that was taught around the world, he saw a little bit of Aikido, he saw a bit of Karate, and he saw a little bit of Judo. So he reckoned perhaps he was entitled, he had got enough knowledge in these three arts to at least get a shodan in jujitsu. What would your opinion be on that? I would probably say if you're holding a black belt, uh, show, let's say theoretically, Shodan and Karate and Judo and Aikido, okay? Yes. I would say, okay, if you want a Shodan in Buddhist Jiu Jitsu, let's try cross certification, go through the process. Yes. And yes. If you have the skill level, then okay, and everything else is, is a, qualifies you, then okay, 
was cross certify you into Budoshin Jiu Jitsu, but then you've you've tested for Budoshin Jiu Jitsu. It's not just well you have these ranks, therefore okay we'll give you a so because homologous. I've never seen a test required for homologous promotion. Okay. It's always been, oh, you've got these, so we're going to give you this. Mm -hmm. And that's, to me, that's, to me, that's the weak point. But that's where the credibility, I say, credibility issue comes in. Uh, yes, yes. Lindsay, I don't know about anybody else, but this, this is entirely a new topic for me. I, I think we've had a, a couple of periods of awkward silence because I'm sitting here kind of slack jaw going, really? <laughs> really ever occurred this way? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is a new low. <laughs> well, the, the real low for me is when I've, I've found my name signed on certificates that I didn't sign. Uh, oh. And that's happened on a couple of occasions. And, well, that's, uh, that's, that's what, sad. What, what I usually do, because usually because I'm not, they've gone to the people of them, this, the, this certificate has been however it was created, it was created. And they take that certificate and go to another organization and say, okay, I have this right. I'd like to be certified by your organization now. Now, mm -hmm. unfortunately, what's happened in both situations is that people in those organizations knew me. Mm. So they either called me up or email me and they said, did you promote so-and-so? You know, this rank. And I'll look at my records and say, no, I, and I simply say, please send me a please send me their email address or mailing address and a copy of their certificate. And they do. And then I just circle my name on the certificate and cross it out and say, this is a no-no. And I send it back to the person. And, <laughs> do they forge your signature as well? Yes. Oh, they scan your signature. Oh, they don't have no, they, they they sign it, but they're not really good at it. That's what. That's why. Oh, I, said, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah see, the so they're trying to actually yeah. copy your signature. Yeah. Oh, that's very they, they bad. Try, or they or they just sign it somehow. Scanning it is is a little more difficult challenge, but that's mm -hmm. that's why, <laughs> for those of you who promote people, particularly the black belt level, you have to keep some sort of record because. Otherwise, people are, you know, they can abuse you, uh, for lack yes. of a phrase, or they can, you know, and in, in at least one of those cases, that quote unquote, that black belt actually closed down his dojo afterwards mm. because somehow his students found out. And I didn't, I didn't contact them in any form or manner, but somehow they found out what he had done and. That's not cool. Uh, <laughs> not at yeah. all. You 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 don't you know you don't forge people's signatures. Uh, you can go to jail for that. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know, yes. So, uh, you know, can I ask? Um, just here's my own promotion from uh, in Budishin. Do these <laughs> seals? Do these seals mean anything? Are these men as some additional assurance that this is legitimate? These well, that's, that's the that's the AJA certificate. Is that Buddha? Right. Uh, yeah, you know it's uh, it's AJA. Yeah, it's, it's. I think I think, and I even you, I even saw have some stamps that have kanji on them, and they yeah. and they don't say you know eat it, Bob's, or you know, or uh, <laughs> you know, or, so that offers an additional level of assurance that you it's from you or it's just. The, nice to have them. The the assurance I have, and, and I do this for, for certificate of security, is on black belt promotions, it requires that I have a picture of the person, hmm. which I for those of you who have black belt certificate, you look at your certificate, and that that picture is part of the actual printed document. It's not glued on. Decades ago it used to be glued on, but now it's and, and there's a stamp that partially covers your picture. Mm. And that, that, is, that process is difficult to duplicate. Mm. 
So, you know, I, I say I, I do, it's, it's sad that one has to do this. Uh, now, not only does it see, but it adds, it adds to your credibility because a person can look at the certificate and say, oh, Darren is Darren, same picture, it matches. <laughs> uh, mm. But he needs to shave, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Aaron, okay, and and that, you know, that's that's nine tenths of the battle for people. They look at the certificate because they know it's they know it's you that the certificate is referring to. Um, does this take longer for me to do? Yeah, it probably takes two or three minutes, but to me, it's worth it. Um, and I haven't had any how do you say forged certificates in the past, probably. I'd probably say five or six years now because uh, I, when I switched over to that process. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a sad commentary on parts of the martial arts community. But as a sensei, you, you know, that's something you have to be aware of, you know. Uh, anyway. So we're back to homologous promotions. So we just want to say these are not cool and leave it rest at that. Or wait, what do you want to think about it? <laughs> Maybe we should, since we're rather than talking about homologous promotions, not to do a bad pun for Dave, but maybe we should just move on. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's move on. Um, What are the advantages and disadvantages of belonging to a martial arts organization? A safe topic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone want to deal with this one? I apologize. What was the, uh, the question again? What are the advantages and disadvantages of belonging to a martial arts organization? Mm. Credibility is one of them. Okay, credibility. Okay. It's amazing how that topic keeps coming up. Okay. Network, networking. Okay. The big family, Ohana, kind of. Okay. Lineage. Uh, let me check. Oh, okay, the credibility, their lineage, what else was mentioned? I said family or, or, or Ohana. You know, the Japanese terminology, I mean, right. the Hawaiian terminology. Right. What was, there was a third, there was a, was there another one? Okay. Um, no one else has any, any other advantages for belonging to an organization? Or that I can use for credibility is authenticity. Necessity. Being authentic. Oh, authentic, authenticity. Okay. I'm jotting these down. These are good. Yeah, I think all of those are, are good. The authenticity, the, the credibility, the validation behind it. I mean, that's, I think, all in part of the credibility. Um, you know, the biggest piece of it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's also creating a standard for uh, for for the network of martial arts, uh, so that we can all we all know what to expect. Uh, just having that that standard uh, does create, uh, in a sense, a stronger com uh, community as well. But it, it does lead to that uh, authenticity and uh, the, the credibility. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the petitioners. Okay. And I, I also think that, that go back to my point, point about Ohana, a family, just a, a, a way you could share with another person, groups of people, share your share techniques and compare and contrast. But, but it's knowledge on both sides of the coin, on the compares, on the, on the similarities and quote unquote, the the, the differences, there's knowledge to be learned on both sides of that coin. Okay. Also, if, if you're forced to have uh, a lot of distance between you and, and other practitioners, like with COVID, 
there's the, the need to physically distance. Um, then if you're part of an organization, it's easier to find people via Zoom or in, in other places to connect to. Uh, whereas if you're sort of isolated and have a very local organization, that's, that's more challenging. Okay. Uh, compensates for physical isolation. If you're the only dojo in Montana, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can connect with someone in Florida. <laughs> Is it raining in Florida, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> should I ask? <laughs> Almost a foot in Miami. Ah, hip waiters won't help, will they? Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately for us, most of it skirted right underneath us. Ah, good. Okay. Uh, what any any disadvantages of belonging to an organization? I mean, no, nobody, nobody has mentioned. Uh, well, we had the Ohana and family, but. No one has mentioned uh, uh, a way to seek promotions. Uh, that's not the only other thing I can think of. In, in the case of the AJA, getting a reasonably priced insurance, that's a, a big issue for some. Yeah, that's a great issue for some, yeah. Uh, and it's a good insurance policy. Years ago, and just to backtrack, years ago, back in the early mid eighties, uh, before our dojo became a 501c3 educational foundation, uh, our insurance agent said, she was a great insurance agent. She says, why don't, since you teach through parks departments, why don't you become a nonprofit? See, that would cut your insurance rate by two thirds. Mm. This is before AJ had an insurance policy. Mm. And, and so we, we became a 501c3 and our insurance, because we had our own policy with our insurance, our insurance costs went down two thirds. And then the next year, the company moved to an off, it would became an offsite insurance company which means it was no longer based in the US. And I said, you know, we love you as an insurance agent. We love what your company has done, but when you're an offshore entity, you have no financial obligation to meet your commitments legally. And so we're at that point, I think we went to the AJA and the AJA decided to go to get a, actually get a policy and uh, provide it to dojos. And uh, so that, that's how the AJA got its insurance policy initially. Hmm. But uh, uh, if you're carrying your own policy and you're not really into it for making any, into jujitsu for making any money, it might be worthwhile considering. Also, it, you end up set, having to set up an uh, entity that is usually a, a corporation and People do not sue nonprofits because they usually have very little money. And it also provides you as a sensei because you become a quote unquote volunteer or employee of this nonprofit corporation. Your individual liability really drops down to almost nothing. Even though you may also be on the board, but with the board, you know, it's the assets of the corporation. And the assets, if you're not making any money, you know, you may not, you know, people want to sue the corporation, fine. Sue the corporation. Although they usually go to the insurance company because the insurance company has a million dollars sitting there for them. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's a whole different story <clears throat> if you want to get into that. Okay. Any disadvantages to belonging to an organization? When it comes to disadvantage, I really don't don't see uh, see much. Uh, I guess one area is you don't as uh, you don't necessarily have uh, I guess freedom to do exactly what, what you want. 
uh, uh, like you can't you can't deviate from from the standards much. Okay. But I, I wouldn't necessarily call it call that a, a, dis a disadvantage. It 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 can be. You know, like we we have a we have a park program in Santa Clarita, and the parks department has certain things we cannot do. Uh, surprisingly, there, there are things we cannot do that when I was a teacher in public school, we could do when I taught jujitsu. It's amazing uh, <laughs> how different governmental agencies have different constraints. Uh, but, you know, life goes on. Um, it also depends on how stringent the requirements of an organization are. Yes. To address Eric's point. The AJA is, you'd have to be pretty... Uh, out of line and criminally negligent or doing something really incredibly awful to be have the AJ step in and do something or and it's explicit in I think George's description of the AJA that it's the AJA isn't here to tell you how to run your dojo or tell you what to do in your your type of jujitsu it's there as a as an umbrella organization so it's it's more or less hands off Right. And, and I think even the Constitution, in the Constitution, it says that uh, the AJA is, is very restricted in terms of telling you how you can conduct the internal operation of your dojo. Once you get your AJA membership and you've met the criteria, uh, then how you run your dojo is essentially up to you as long as you're not doing anything illegal, immoral, or anything of that sort. But back, but back to the, uh, the, the uh, I'm not, it's not a comment on the negative, but just on the positive of the organization. Someone said it's standards, like the concussion protocol. Uh, uh, that was something that was ahead, uh, ahead of the curve and still is ahead of the curve uh, with a lot of organizations don't have that. Uh, the uh, uh, first aid and CPR, I mean, that should be standard, but yeah. you run into people who are not, uh, um, a, a CPR or AED certified. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in my profession, even as a school teacher, I think every school teacher should be required to know first aid and CPR. Every school, I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, you've got, you know, I'd have like in a day I, with five different classes of 40 kids, I, I'd have maybe 180, 200 different people a day. You know, stuff can happen. It has happened in my classroom. And because I had first aid training, I was able to, you know, even that didn't even include teaching jujitsu. I was able to deal with it. Now, the other side of the coin is, or another side of the coin is that I had first aid training way back in the 50s and 60s where they, you know, they taught you how to set splints. They taught you how to do two to four man carries, you know, without a, without a stretcher, they taught you uh, uh, all sorts of stuff that is no longer taught in a basic first aid course, which I think is sad. Uh, today, it's basically if the person is breathing, don't touch them. Um, unless it's, you know, avoid getting sued. Pardon? To avoid part and sometimes to avoid getting sued to avoid getting sued and uh, first thing you do is, is call 911 or have someone call 911 um, and if you have to you know or if you have to stop you know the only time you intercede is to stop bleeding if it's serious uh, to move them by pulling their feet actually uh, if you need to move them to protect them from further danger uh, or to apply CPR, um, which you need CPR training for. And that's basically it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, but I still think something is better than nothing. And I, I think it's, you know, something that, how do you say, every... Every sensei should know this. I mean, you should know. Uh, I haven't had a student at the park program. I haven't had a student. I, I, yeah, you do have injuries. They happen on occasion. Okay. 
I haven't had a student go into shock for years, but I know what to do if a person goes into shock. And calling 911 can be too late. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so, you know, I think every sense they should have, and at first aid training still, I think, still trains you to how to deal with a person who goes in, into shock uh, or how to tell if a person is going to go into shock. Because uh, usually there are signals. It's almost like a person who's who's having a stroke or who just had a stroke. Uh, yeah, so if you're a parent considering having your child take a Buddhist jiu-jitsu class or an adult going into the class, you know that um, the, these uh, sensei have been taught or they, they have, they're right. familiar with, with these essential life-saving measures of concussion, sure. et cetera. The yeah. AJA also uh, takes that a step further in some ways uh, and does background checks for sensei who are AJA certified sensei. They have, a, uh, there are criminal and I guess like sexual offender background checks. So you know that your teenager is going to be safe or there, there, there's no evidence of the sensei having those kinds of problems. Right. Right. And that's, and that's, you know, that's parents want to have security. Like with, with Santa Cruz parks, we all have to be fingerprinted mm. and they do a check. And, you know, from my teaching career and, and other age law enforcement agency, I've been, I must, I've been fingerprinted at least 20, 30 times. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I, I would be surprised if God doesn't have a record of my fingerprints, but <laughs> not to be facetious, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it, and they do a background check based on that. Um, and and it, it's, how do you say, it's sad that the world is that paranoid, but, you know, everybody has a CYA. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, uh, Ask Tom or Dave. Uh, no, they don't want to be. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, yeah, the disadvantage of an organization is it may, some organizations may limit what you can do, what you can teach. Uh, they may limit how fast you can be promoted or if you can be promoted. Uh, there can be, you know, and personalities can come into play, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of there are disadvantages to belonging to an organization if you if you choose to follow that organization's criteria, and and again, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and. Some of these associations are all just about making money. That's all they true. want is to try and get money from everybody who joins. There's always some uh, s- something that you have to keep paying, and that can be a disadvantage because you realize these people aren't there to help you. They're just right. trying to be a money-making yeah. racket. It, it amazes and they use me. Big names, and they use big names in the association, so you feel it's okay to pay it because you think, oh, well, I belong to some... Uh, association with some well-known founders. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had people that are absolutely astounded at how little the AJA charges for certificates. Exactly, right. yes. But it's not all like that. Some of them really want a lot of money. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about thousands of dollars, plus you have to travel yes. to the moon, uh, in, in which case you'll see, what, what's his name who owns Tesla? Uh, <laughs> Us, is it Musk? Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have to go to Musk. You have to go to the moon and, <laughs> and check with Musk to see if you get a certificate of rank. I'm, I'm not picking on Musk, just an example that came to mind. Um, some of them are, yeah, and, and they're totally amazed at the age of a charge so little. Um, mm. Mm. <clears throat> and, and some people say, you know, Buddhist. You, you don't charge anything for certificates of rank, you know? Yes, yes. And, or, you know, it's, it's you know, yeah. As you said, some, you, you, there's some certificate organizations you want to certificate, go online. 
you know, you can pay a couple, three thousand dollars and get oh, as much as that. Yeah, that's a lot. It's Oof. amazing. <clears throat> Budishan and AJA are sort of at one end of the spectrum in that yeah. they're low cost to get uh, these certifications, but the, the, the standards are high versus organizations that are disreputable and have very low standards, but have very high costs because they just want to get paid and, and give you some certificate. Tom, they think that uh, if, they, if they charge a lot of money, it makes them look like, you know, they're somebody, they're yeah. a big association. It's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it doesn't it's compete. Yeah, that way. The, 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 the same thing occurs in academia, which I'm sure Robert is familiar with. There are, uh, I'll say it very loosely, uh, diploma mills, you know, where, where I, could, I could put out anywhere from four to $8,000 and they would mail me my, my doctorate. Mm. Um, and then I can say, I'm a doctor. Now you can call me Dr. George Kirby. Uh, <laughs> uh, PhD. And PhD can have, for those of you who are not in the college game, that are familiar with the, what BS means, MS means, and PhD, some people are smiling and some people are looking concerned. Should I tell you? <laughs> Should I do the definitions, Robert? Please. Yes. Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, <laughs> higher and deeper. Is, is there somebody who is not? That's familiar? a PhD, but yeah. That's, uh... Yeah. <laughs> Most BS, BS is bull. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. MS is more I know of that the same. Yeah. MS is more of the same. And PhD <laughs> is about higher and deeper. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. So if you've never heard of that, I mean, you know. <clears throat> anyhow. Um, do we want to go on to uh, next question is I'm getting up in years. When should I retire? Uh, I say I, I, I've got a prayer commitment. I need to bolt too. So. Okay. I, I, I think we'll leave we're, we've been on for about an hour and a half. I think we'll leave that for next time. Uh, so some of you can give it some thought. Uh, what was the question again? Question is, I'm, I'm getting up in years. When should okay. I retire? What do I do if there are techniques that I can no longer teach without risking personal injury? Oh, that's a I'm good actually facing both. I've been facing both of those for years, but um, uh, some people have asked, "Why haven't I retired yet?" And I don't know where that. No, we don't want you. you. You mustn't retire. Never. I mustn't retire. <laughs> <laughs> For the sake of the conversation on the, yes, on the next time, I'd say so, there is no retirement. Okay. For 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 some people, retirement is a state of mind. Uh, there are other definitions too, but you know it's. Uh, Ideally, I'd like to keep teaching until, quote, unquote, the end, you know, kick the bucket on the mat, you know, everybody. Else we don't like to go that way. I think yeah, we don't like, like to go that way. Then all your students come up to you and say, should we try CPR? Or, <laughs> or just roll them up in a mat? <laughs> <laughs> Do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate. <laughs> anyway, we can save this sick humor for another time. Uh, <laughs> I won't remember it anyway. Anyway, so uh, let's let's end this here now, and uh, we'll meet again in two weeks, which will be June fourth. I think we're skipping the week of the nineteenth and switching it to the twenty fifth, because the nineteenth is my wife's and my forty sixth wedding anniversary, and I don't. I, yes, I remember you telling us that. Yeah, and I don't know what's planned for that weekend yet, but I want to keep it clear. So, well, I, I will be in the Cayman Islands on that date, but I'll try to join you. Okay. I, I'll be teaching a seminar there in the Cayman Islands. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> Doing diving mostly, but. <laughs> Maybe working on your kata. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> okay, very good. We, we expect to see video of your diving skills. 
Uh, we, we didn't get the invite. Okay. We didn't get the invite, Robert. That's right. I will. I will have them for you. Can I be cross certified in scuba jujitsu? Scuba <laughs> jujitsu. Okay. Scuba jujitsu. Jujitsu. <laughs> anyway, have a have a great weekend. Don't do anything too dangerous, and uh, don't get wet, Robert. Oh yeah, not until the twenty fourth. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you either, Dave. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. Bye. Thanks to you all. All right. Yep. You guys have a good one. Take care, y'all. We'll see you. Okay. Thank you for a wonderful meeting. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Sensei, June 25th, you said next? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.